Well, I just want to say welcome to everyone. Give everyone a few minutes to start joining. Uh, of course, this is our second AMA with the lovely Mick Kirsten, author of Project Product, CEO of TaskTop, and host of Mick Plus One podcast. Yes. Any other titles, Mick? I think that's everything. That. Yeah, that sounds like everything. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I just want to let all of the uh, all of our watchers know that you can go and place more questions for Mick over in the Slack space or right here on Zoom in the Q&A section or chat section. If you post a question, I should find it. I'm gonna start with some of the questions that have already been on Slack. Um, but yes, as I say, feel free to add more and we'll record this as well and post it after the fact. So if you miss anything, uh, you'll be able to watch later. All right, Mick, are you ready? I am ready. Yes, okay. fire away. Let's fire away. First question. How do you articulate business working in project mode and IT in product mode? Can it work? No. <laughs> it, to elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I can elaborate. The, the book is just a one long elaboration on it. Right. And I think, you know, fundamentally, that's the challenge is that, uh, so technologists, development teams, feature teams, and the like, agile teams, uh, we're all over the last decade or two, and we're just naturally working in this product mode where what we're trying to do is deliver value to our clients, deliver value to the customer. We wouldn't be building things. We wouldn't be doing our professions if we weren't inherently working in a mode where what we want to do is deliver value that, that end users like. And that, that, that is the product mode. Um, the, where you've got you know, product life cycles, when you've, you've got a customer. Fund, fundamentally, this, this product mode is about a customer. It could be an internal customer. It could be a development team itself or a developer. Uh, but in the end, they're pulling value from, from the great work that we're doing. Now, the challenge, of course, is and, and what the book highlights is the, that, that while transformations are going on, while development teams are working in this, these agile ways, applying the principles of DevOps, when the business, the, the business is often still coming from the context of treating IT and technology as a cost center and actually managing that work with, with projects. And it's that mismatch that's so problematic and that really gets in the way of transformations, of allowing teams to innovate, of allowing teams to do the, the great work that they want to do. So the, the answer is no, it, it doesn't work. And the business needs to switch from project to product uh, in order to for an organization to transform to becoming a technology organization. If you don't make a switch, you could be as agile as you want. You could be have the the, the best DevOps practices and and uh, a million deploys per day going on, and it won't make enough of a difference because the way that the work is coming into the teams is is misaligned with the way that that technology work needs to happen, creative work needs to happen. So it really is around getting uh, the technology and the business. Uh, oriented around value streams. Now, I will caveat this, uh, this statement where uh, you've got sometimes a business context that does need long running projects. So I'll give you an example. One, one of our customers, actually this is, there's a webinar with this where I, I spoke with the uh, former CTO of Cuba Corporation where they have very long running projects because they deliver transportation systems say to the city of Chicago or New York. So there is no way to get out of that being a 10 year project. Right? That's, that's just how those things are funded. That's how cities buy software in this case, or software and hardware. So uh, what we need to do is within that sort of budging and planning and, and procurement process, actually make sure that there's the way that work is being planned is product oriented. So even though you've got this project umbrella uh, under there, what you can do is actually take the principles of, uh, of product orientation and apply them. And some of those principles that, that come from the flow framework, for example, not only to be looking at plans and be moving, assigning different developers to eight different projects within this one big project, but to actually create stable product value streams and to make sure that you're actually measuring flow in those product value streams and that you're actually measuring how much tech that is built up. Because of course the challenge with the product plans is they never account for technical debt or some of those other issues that we see with flow. So even when you're in a project context of you know long basically very long running uh, engagements with say to be large customers government organizations and the like you can still apply the principles of uh, product development and flow within that context and you know and 
there, there are challenges. For example, one of the things that we often see is uh, when you've got too much product project orientation as the umbrella, it gets, it's quite hard to invest in the platforms that might need to be shared between different projects, right? So you might need to create common data and analytics platforms, and that's, that's difficult. But having that conversation saying, okay, even though we're, we're in this project context, how do we apply the, apply the principles of product development uh, is a very helpful conversation because, because in the end, what it'll allow you to do is more successfully deliver on, on those very large and long running projects. But fundamentally, the way that you wanna connect development and technology and business is through these product value streams. Right. It looks like uh, Andy over here on the chat has kind of a follow-up question to that. What needs to be done to get the current business side prepared to integrate with IT? IT work tends to have periods of debate and discussion that the business would interpret as things going poorly instead of it being healthy and normal. Yeah, so I think that th this is where the the goal of the flow frameworks to have it make sure that there's a portion of those discussions that, that are that are done together right and i think what's happened is that their organizations already know at least organizations that are that have you know, moved far enough in terms of development practices they already know that roadmap discussions are important for example and every business stakeholder knows they want their next thing on the roadmap and, and they also know that they want, want the roadmap to go faster however what happens with those roadmap discussions and those planning and release planning discussions is it's i need that feature i need that feature that need that feature on the it and technology side uh, when you're actually looking at how how are we going to deliver on this what you you do need to have these longer discussions well we've got an architecture problem we have to move on to this new you know, front end framework or something of that sort. Uh, we're missing some APIs or you know, we really have to you know, change the way that we manage data. And so the goal of the flow framework is to actually elevate the parts of that discussion that you're having within the technology teams to the business and actually make it part of a release planning. And to really do that in a, in a couple different ways. One is through uh, just making sure elevating the, the flow items. So what will often happen, the four flow items in the flow framework features defects, risks, and debts. The goal is to actually that risks and debts, which are often ignored by the business counterparts, they actually become a part of the discussion. So you can have a discussion, well, if we don't reduce technical debt here, we're actually going to slow down the roadmap delivery month after month because we really need to modernize this part of our stack. And that actually then becomes a part of the discussion that's not just trapped within IT and technology, where in the end, no one gets any credit for it because the technical network is invisible, it's not appreciated, it's not celebrated, whereas it's actually critical to hitting business objectives when you're looking at things beyond the release cycle and onto you know, timeframes of, of six months or a year or more. So the number one thing is to elevate some of that discussion that you're having to the business and the planning discussion. And the, the key ways to do that is to elevate risk and debt and have those discussions on flow distribution. So a very concrete way uh, that, that we see organizations do this successfully is just to, to make that part of release planning. So when you're doing your release plans, you actually not only plan the features that you're doing, and of course, everyone's always, you know, understands that some capacity needs to go into, into, into defects, but you're actually also elevating the discussions around risks and debts. And the risk run tend to be easy, easier, I should say, because, I, it's, it's still, I should, it is very common that the risk work is not properly made visible. And another key IT revolution book, making work visible is, 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 a, is an absolutely important part of, of getting this right. So we wanna make all work visible. The risk work is the compliance, the security, the other work, so elevate that and make that part of those release planning discussions. Uh, and then of course the teams are then getting credit for it. You're not just always feeling like you're falling behind on features. And, and then also note when you know, a, a release went sideways because an audit happened and all this unplanned, thinking back to the Phoenix project, all this unplanned compliance work came up. You also wanna note that and make that visible. And again, then you'll actually start putting capacity into your release planning for potentially unplanned uh, compliance work down the road. Uh, and then debts, of course, the key thing is to make the technical network visible, but to do it in a way that uh, that that makes economic sense to the business discussion because if it's if if, you know, if I've, I've found people I've worked with constantly you know 
getting frustrated because then while we're saying we need to work on tech that we need to work on tech that tech that and then going to this litany of reasons that are related to their their stack and this these really technological components and architecture issues uh, i think the key thing with tech debt to make it an effective part of the business discussion is is to make the economic case for it and to say okay well if we invest in tech debt here our feature flow how many features we're able to deliver the customers will accelerate by x and you measure that in the flow time measure that in the flow velocity so the key thing is to to really make it make this part of a first class part of, of, of how you do planning and involve a business, but again, at, at the right level and with uh, making that discussion be, be economic. That's really the goal of the flow framework. Yeah, what I'm hearing on a very simplistic level is definitely transparency and honest communication between the business and IT. Yes, yes. Leah, that's right. It's, and but but I think the key thing is is at the right level. So if we think mm -hmm. back to um, you know, that that fireside chat uh that that Gene had where we um I was the gentleman from the CEO of CompuWare who was telling us Somali about Chris. Crabs. Yeah, exactly. Uh who was saying about and there was a really interesting moment, I think, in the in, in our collective seniors here, because he was saying, you know, don't don't tell me these technical things. Don't make those cases. You know, give me give me some kind of economic case. So make it transparent, but at the right level, because I think the challenge is then the frustration comes from business and technology speaking a different language, and they're both important. And so we need to connect them with a common language, and that common language is this flow and value streams. So. You, I think it, it is important that the way the information is presented, again, technically, that's a perfect example. We're meant to be, think of the fifth ideal, unicorn project now, uh, skipping between the different IT rare books. <laughs> um, so the, the customer centricity, what we've got is, is, I think we agree, customer centricity is important, right? But then what customer ever asked anyone to reduce tech debt? Right. Nobody, right? No customers don't see tech debt. It's not. It's not work that's actually visible to the customer. Uh, and of course, what will often happen is the business counterparts will articulate things that they believe are are visible and relevant to the customer. Hence, they never actually prioritize tech debt. And why would they? Because the customers don't care about it. Now, of course, it hits customers in the long term, which yeah. is why again making that economic case. We need to invest now, or we need to have a good cadence of continual improvement on this front, uh, so that we can continue doing great things for our customers. That's the way to do it, and that's that's just a way of reframing this economic case. So I think the transparency is is key, uh, and I think the other really important, but but again at the right level and with the right language, uh, and with the language being around again flow and and value. And I think the other important thing about the transparency is you know, it does need to go both ways because the flow metrics are meant to surface some of the dynamics that are, are so important for the business to understand is that for another, just as another example, if we're putting too much work in pr progress, WIP or, or flow load, as it's measured in the flow framework on the teams, they'll get less done. That's a dynamic that business leaders, if they haven't experienced software development, they might not have understood. They might think that we should use everyone to 110% of their capacity and we'll get lots done and it'll be great. Uh, and that's not the case. That's just not how how uh, software development flow works. So we want the flow metrics to make those dynamics transparent, uh, but it has to work the other way as well. Like for example, it's and that's why the flow framework has those business results at the top right of it, which is uh, if everyone's meant to be the whole goal. Of course, is that value streams have autonomy over their own work, over setting their flow metrics, of working to to these objectives, and the. The key thing is that the you know th those those business objectives actually do flow down. So you know what is the value metric? Who is the customer? If this is an internal component that we're building, who is the customer of the internal component? So I think that the other important thing, Leah, about the transparency point that I want to make sure we make clear is that it, it's it needs to go both ways. It's not just technology to business. It's it's got to be business to technology as well. Excellent. Okay, we have a question here from Slack. Now in chapter seven, um, and this person is having their own, was having their own book club in their team. Um, oh, I'm going to grab my book then. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the book club is having some trouble understanding the connection you're trying to make in the first epiphany. While large scale software developers are very familiar with the phenomenon of thrashing and productivity loss, we've mostly understood it to be a function of architectural incoherence and nonlinear growth of communication paths, not value stream disconnection. Is the architectural incoherence a symptom of value stream disconnection? Is there something else we're missing? 
Yes. So I think, so yeah, that's a super interesting question. The way I think about it is to we as individuals and uh, we understand what, you know, what causes our thrashing, right? Is when we have to go to different places to find information, when we have uh, dependencies on people, right? So uh, when we've got, you know, we can't get something done, we can't get something cleared out of our inbox, we can't close a ticket or, or, or finish a feature uh, un until we resolve those dependencies or ask, you know, ask someone for input, ask someone for approval or verification or all those sorts of things. And what happens is the more of those things happen to us in our day-to-day -day work, the more we thrash. And then as soon as we're thrashing on 10 things waiting on someone else, work starts being a whole lot less fun, right? Because we, you know, you're, you're just you're just all over the place. And so the observation that we made that uh, was a key input on some of the research going into a project to product. And by the way, my initial studies were around that developer thrashing at that individual level. What I noticed is it was, you know, it kind of gets similar on the teams. When, you, when you're looking at a team, if a team is now depending on someone else for some API, no one's paying attention to their pull requests, these kinds of things, you actually get a similar thrashing effect at the team level. And the, the really interesting thing that, that I realized after that is that the same thing happens at the team of teams level. And so if, you, if you've got all these, so the team of teams levels, we have value streams, right? And those value streams are, are key because in the end, they, they deliver big pieces of, you know, of functionality. They deliver the one of the 160 or however many there are Amazon services. Each of those is su supported by a value stream, a set of teams. Um, and their dependencies and the weight states in terms of them depending on each other actually cause that same kind of thrashing. And if you don't formalize your value streams, what happens is you, you get this kind of combinatorial set of dependencies between all the teams. And so let's say every team is responsible for their own microservice, that the number of microservice dependencies just get, gets crazy and very difficult to manage. And so by actually making sure to treat these product value streams as a unit themselves, you've got, kind of got the individual, you've got the team, and then you have the product value streams, you, you formalize that team of teams construct, uh, we actually have a very nice and clear path for understanding how to make teams you know, stay in, so these teams of teams, the value streams stay in their flow. So you basically, the goal becomes minimizing the dependencies between the different product value streams through things like APIs and microservices and versioning and such, uh, and giving them autonomy. Because what we know is if, you know, the more that they can stay within their flow, the less they have to go to, let's say, a whole other team or part of the organization to get, I don't know, to, to get some graphics or images or, or screens designer, those kinds of things. The more that's embedded in the value stream, the more autonomous they are, the better their flow. So yeah, the, the whole goal is that same kind of flow that we feel individually when we don't have all those weight states. We want to provide that at the team of teams construct. And by measuring flow efficiency, the things that introduce weight states to that value stream that often are external to those teams and can't, again, can't be fixed by them, we can actually remove those bottlenecks and make everything flow faster. So, so the key thing is that, that thrashing that we know happens at, at, at the individual level, the team level, and also at the product value stream level. And the, yeah, the point of the flow framework is to help us see it, make that thrashing visible at that level, and then remove those bottlenecks and help teams reduce dependencies between value streams and, and the like. So. Great. And of course, back to, a little bit back to that question, uh, our, that's, that's where architecture is key. Because what so often happens once you've removed some of the simplest bottlenecks, uh, a lot of the bottlenecks will actually come from architectural dependencies that, that span teams and don't allow them to work independently. So one of the things that you might notice once you start measuring this is the more that you can align the architecture to supporting independence between those value streams, the better the flow. And it just means more investment in architecture, more investment in platforms, more investments in APIs and the like. Excellent. Next question. Uh, what's your opinion on throughput accounting? Oh, that's an interesting one. So I, uh, when I was writing Project to Product, yeah, and I know Goldratt spent a good chunk of his career, I, def I got very interested in it. And because I thought, you know, is, is this the answer? Uh, so I will, I started you know, studied it a fair amount. I am by no means an expert. I went to my own CFO who actually had used throughput accounting, which was fascinating because it never really took off as, as far as I know. Uh, he, he'd used throughput accounting uh, within, a, it was an airline parts, airplane parts manufacturer for, for commercial airplanes, at, you know, a lean shop. Uh, and 
Yeah, the interesting thing to me is I think the spirit of it made a whole lot of sense, but it didn't get adopted broadly. So I think to me, it's kind of a, it's a challenge, right? They're, the ideas that were good in the end, the flow framework is trying to capture some of that essence of throughput accounting by having us be able to measure and quantify flow. But it doesn't actually say we should replace our business metrics with the flow metrics. It says we should combine the two. So for example, let's, you know, a business metric could be profitability or, or revenue uh, or retention or something of that sort. And what the flow framework says is, you know, let's make sure we're measuring flow and seeing how investment in improving flow and in, in delivery is actually helping move that business metric. And let's do it at the value stream level. So it's, it's the flow framework basically creates this, this correlation, not causation, saying, okay, well, when we, when we do great work on a value stream, when we improve flow, that should move a, a metric. When you deliver more features that make more customers happy, that should improve the net promoter score and drive more active usage of, let's say, that, that mobile application. But sometimes it won't. And it won't because, because these software is so complex and markets and customers are so complex that I don't think you can draw that straight line, or at least in the, I, I couldn't figure out how to do it for the flow framework. Because what, what's, what actually happens is you could, have a, you could be delivering the best features and, you know, every other day, uh, but if you have a market fit problem or if half your customer's base has gone to a competitor, that business metric won't improve because you've actually got, you, there's nothing you can do within that value stream uh, that, that, that's going to make those users more happy when, when the market dynamics are causing the issue. So really the, the flow framework tries to kind of decompose and simplify those, some of those goals of, or I think the, the, uh, the goals of throughput accounting by saying, hey, well, let's quantify and measure flow. And then let's correlate that to business results so that we can know whether more flow is improving those business results uh, or if it's not having an effect, and if it's not having an effect, again, it, it tends to be because of, of market or, or dynamics external to the value stream. So, so yeah, uh, yeah, I, I am. This is a super interesting topic. Yeah, if anyone wants to follow up on this or has more insights on it, uh, I'd love to hear about it. But again, I think it's. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to see that the way the flow framework is being adopted is actually providing some of this, like just a quantifiable way of of measuring flow. Great. Okay, next question. How do you view the future regarding make or buy, sometimes called a make or die? How do you make that decision? And do you have recommendations on where to read more? Yeah, and so I guess it's a really good question and the make or die is a really good answer <laughs> because I think, but I, I, there is a bit of nuance to it. So in the project probably definitely implies that to, to thrive is in, in the age of software, organizations have to become great at, at, at managing software delivery and at building software. Now, the reality is that a lot of the organizations I work with, uh, you use, uh, you know, actually will procure, get a lot of off the shelf software. And of course we we'll use a lot of contractors and integrators and, and others to, uh, uh, to build software as well. Now, I think the, and, it looks like there's, I think the bottom line is, I think that the answer here is, in the end, worldly maps are a great answer, right? The bottom line is if it's your core, you need to make it, right? But, but uh, if you, you believe that, and if it's, if it's your context, and this is of course going to, to Jeffrey Moore, uh, more than Simon Wardley, but if it's your context, you should be able to buy it. So, uh, you know, if it's cloud infrastructure, well, chances are it's not your core, if that's Amazon's core and, and Microsoft's core and Google's core, so you should not be buying that. But then there might be layers on top of that where you're, you know, you're building your own automation and services and so on that that layer on that. And I think the the, the key thing here is actually understanding and refining what your core is. As let's say you know you are looking at cloud, as Amazon is continuing to release more services, actually having a roadmap of understanding what will shift from from core to context, where you can actually consume as services. We review this. I know at Tesla, we review this regularly. You just end up looking at, at the roadmaps of the cloud vendors and understand, okay, well, should we redirect some of our resources because we'll be able to consume this, this service at some later point uh, or some, some, some point soon. So I think the, the key thing is you should be tracking flow uh, ac across this. So basically across your entire technology stack, right? You might have, 
I'll give you I'll give an, another example. You have two lines of business or two separate value streams, right? Uh, one has created its own I don't know, dependency injection framework, some of its own software architecture. The other one is using some of those as a service or is using something more modern like, like Lambda. You should be able to measure the flow of each and to understand, okay, well, in the case where we're actually using the off the shelf service, uh, given you know, what we've got in terms of the cost profile of that value stream, are we getting more velocity? If we are, great, let's actually start adopting this. And there's a, on the Project to Product podcast, there's a really good story uh, from a gentleman from um, Liberty IT, uh, David Anderson, where he actually talks about this. We demonstrate faster flow because of Lambda. Uh, so we realized that, okay, we no longer should be building those parts of our own infrastructure. That's something we should be buying effectively. So getting it in, in their case from, from Amazon because the flow is faster because we're able to, to, to deliver more to market. So I think the key thing is, Measure flow, whether you're buying or whether you're making or buying, uh, and then make the decisions on what you do based on how they, how they improve or impede your flow. You know, it's possible that Lambda could be a complete misfit for it because of some of the backend systems that you've got. It doesn't work. And so actually flow actually slowed down, even though for all your peers in your industry, it's sped up. So the point of the flow framework is to make these decisions not just on sort of opinions or architectural views of technology, but, but with real empirical, with real data within your organization, because you'll often see surprise that something that worked for one organization didn't, didn't work for another. But the assumption, of course, is software, more and more software is core. So when I, you know, one thing that I, I know frustrates me is speaking to some government organizations who who assume that uh, they can buy everything or everything can be done by, by, by contractors. It's, and I find if you actually look at, if they, they also should measure flow, even if you're building none of your software in-house and it's all done by buying and then kind of having custom development done by uh, third parties, that's outsourcing, you still should measure your flow. And uh, more often than not, you'll see that your flow is probably uh, much, much slower than organizations have actually made software delivery uh, a core part of their competencies. And this has just been an absolutely fascinating thing. It's been a fascinating thing to me through COVID actually seeing uh, some of the uh, governments who were able to move fast, the fact that they actually treat more of their software as core, have more software developers. I don't have any data on this, by the way, this is all anecdotal. Um, maybe, yeah, Leah, maybe you can ask Jean to dig, I'll, I'll ask Jean to dig some stuff up on this because this right. would be a fascinating <laughs> story. Um, but the, the ones who treat software as core, who, who are you know, living the age of software, not just outsourcing their, their existence in the age of software, uh, actually were able to, those government agencies were able to adapt more quickly, again, anecdotally, uh, to vaccine distribution and the like, and those kinds of systems, where the, the ones who didn't, I, I, I certainly saw some stories where they moved much more slowly. So I think make more so make software core. I think that's one thing. But regardless of what your Wardly map looks like, what your ecosystem of uh, of software looks like, um, you, you need to measure flow across the whole thing. Yeah, great. And I think you and Jean need to do some uh, research on things from the COVID pandemic. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question: What are some ways to pirate flag a shift to doing value stream management with near zero budget? I know there are some tools and I know many will do a POC. However, looking to see how to get interest by using existing metrics, I think I can show some things with what we have in place, get interest, then build business case for doing it proper with dedicated tooling. My group is very much the Rebel Alliance when we need to be. Well, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, so I would say focus, and I've seen it both ways. You know, One way is just to, to start tagging things more in the tools and the rest. And, that's important. It's just a little trickier to scale. I would say do it a bit more, not, not, not to discourage you from doing that. I think it's worth trying, but do it a, a bit more at the higher level. So basically take the four flow items. And when you do planning, even though you won't have you know, visibility or traceability of what the actual you know, flow distribution was, as we were talking about before, still take those concepts into your planning. So when you've got these larger roadmap items going on, those discussions happening, take the flow items and say, okay, well, how much are we roughly? Because you won't have the real data, but that's okay to start. Uh, and to start to kickstart this kind of rebel alliance, how much are we investing in features versus defects versus risks or debts? And what is the business case for our debt reduction? What, what kind of flow are we increasing? Uh, what, what are the main causes of our, of our flow inefficiency? So, you know, you can start asking the teams the same questions, you know, you'll get kind of survey and anecdotal answers back, 
you won't get empirical answers back, but it's still a starting point saying what, where are most of the weight states and you know, run a query. So it won't quite be scalable, but it's a start. And it starts the organization thinking of the value of tracking these flow items and tracking things like, like flow time and flow efficiency. So I would just start it kind of informally that way, but, but not just on the team level, do it on the actual planning level whether it's, you know, it's monthly or quarterly or annual planning, start adopting th these language and these principles, and it'll actually get people thinking and, and appreciating the right thing and, and thinking of managing these value streams. And of course, then that helps make the case of actually, you know, proper implementation of that, so. Great. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. A, that's a really good question, because I think the, the I, it was really important to me that it is, it is easier to, to get started, and I wish I'd put a, a bit more of that into the book. I think I had some, like, I had some chapters outlined <laughs> that never quite got to. We've put some, some of these things on flowframer.org, but in terms of like, getting started, but you start with a concept, start, start with applying the concepts and, and start using them today, so. Uh, yes, volume two, the how-to, absolutely. Yes. Project yeah. to product, the workbook. <laughs> In 10 easy steps, right? <laughs> yeah, and flow by and flow from the other, there is there is more and more material on this front. And yeah, we are of and of course the other thing is we're learning for what what started more successfully, what started less successfully. And I think the key learning I'm trying to get across on this front that should go at some point into a volume two thing, uh that that Leo would be interested in, I as she said before. Um is uh, is again start at that planning level. Start you know do 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 this at the more strategic level because that that's when you'll see the effectiveness and and the uh, the buy-in from it. So excellent. Okay, and we'll find some of those links and post them into the Slack afterwards for people who are looking for even more resources. Uh, next question: Would you please address the topic of aggregation? We want to connect work to business value while our business wants metrics at a higher level of abstraction than a single product. What is the flow framework answer to this ask? Yeah, so the question of aggregation is, and it's, it, it's, a, it's an interesting and, and important question. And it's, uh, I think I've only had six discussions about this question in this past week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the one of them within the mighty professor for the record because it's the challenge with aggregation and averaging and those sorts of things is so first of all the flow framework is meant to support aggregation right you want to be able to roll up these metrics and the rest what we're seeing that's been really interesting in the data sets around product value streams is the high level of variance within them so you'll have you know a value stream with a flow efficiency of one percent and one with a flow efficiency of sixty percent and when you take the average of, let's say, you know, 10 that are like that, uh, you, know, you can get into these very sort of biased decisions uh, if you're only looking at the average, if you're lo only looking at the rollups and the aggregations. So the really, but the bottom line is they're still important, right? It's, it's still important to know, you know, what, what is our overall flow time trend? And you, you can think of this, the analogy that came up in the most recent discussion I had is, well, you know, if you're, if this is not a great analogy, so we then definitely need a better one, but at least not a pleasant one. But if you're looking at the, you know, at the, at the uh, infection rates for the world for COVID, just looking at the world is, 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 is not enough, right? If you never look down at what's happening in different regions, you know, to help understand, you know, how we're headed, how well we're doing, uh, you know, where the, you know, where the key problems are. So the, the key thing is, to not ignore, it's it, you just the, the the bottom line is you need both, right? You need to understand this at the portfolio level, what the portfolio looks like. The New York Times was great at this, right? They didn't just show the one number; they always, you know, gave you inline charts for various parts of the world, various parts of the U.S. and the like. Uh, whereas a lot of other things didn't do that. They didn't, they, you know, that then a lot, you know, people make all these inferences and assumptions that could actually be misleading. So. A lot of you know my personal work lately actually has been on uh, on making better and better sort of board CEO executive level views of flow for large very large portfolios. Uh, and what we've learned through that process is to do that, you actually you know really need to also from an information visualization perspective also really need to inform people of what what that distribution looks like. Like, are you, should you be happy that everything is is going up by five percent in terms of flow efficiency? Or should you be really unhappy because the most important places you've overloaded the teams with so much flow load, their efficiency is tanking. And so anything that you think is, is you know, your business goals actually won't be achieved. 
So the flow framework and the flow metrics are meant to support aggregation. And meant, you know, you can measure the flow of, of you know, I started measuring my own flow, right? As, a, as an open source developer and as, as, as a, of, my of my team. Um, so we could find our, our bottlenecks. Uh, and uh, so the, you know, the developer, the team, the value stream, a program or a line of business and the rest. Uh, and I think the interesting thing is that we're learning is how important it is to, to, to show the portfolio as well, not just show the average, not just show the aggregation. But um, the answer is yes, you, you can, you know, you can aggregate that information. Great. So there's definitely always danger in only looking at the aggregated data. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we're just being very careful as we get more and more sort of, you know, board exact level views on the flow metrics and how that's presented. And anyone else who's doing something similar, just to keep that in mind is just to understand what that portfolio looks like so that the information is, is not uh, triggering the wrong conclusions. Great. Okay, next question. Um, in the last AMA and also today, uh, you referred to some value streams as class one or first class. Um, can you say more about classification of value streams into categories or classes? What's the purpose and criteria for this? Does it have more to do with importance of the product? Class one is more important than class two or a way to treat aggregation. Class one consists of a, or a bunch of class twos. Uh, so I actually don't think, and it might've been a, I wonder what word I actually did use, but I don't think of value streams in terms of classes. Okay. I think of them in terms of the customers that they serve. And basically, I think I was probably talking about the layers. So you've got this, you know, the, the, what everyone instantly jumps to when they're creating their product portfolios is this, this, this top layer of customer and business facing value streams. So those are you know, the mobile experience, the logon experience, the um, things that, that customers touch. Uh, and the customers, you know, in some cases, could be a business partner as well, so logistics system, something of that sort. So those are the, 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 the external customer facing things. Uh, now, the value streams where the customer is internal so the customer, let's say, if you're building a, a data analytics pipeline, the customer of that is actually the different value streams delivering the applications on top of that pipeline. So your customers are internal. And the point is that that product value stream is just as first class. It's just as important. A value stream that's your, your uh, delivery pipeline, right? That, that captures your, uh, uh, you know, basically your, your DevOps automations and principles and controls and methodologies and the like that value stream, the people building that pipeline, the people creating, you know, basically adopting and customizing and extending the tools that support that pipeline, your continuous integration, your continuous delivery and release automation tools, that's just the first class value stream, as first class of product and value stream, that needs its own roadmap. If someone wants to add automated uh, license checking or some other controls or vulnerability detection or something of that sort, that's a feature request and a roadmap item on that value stream. The value stream has developers or SREs or others, others supporting it. And, uh, and you know, they also need to track their flow. They have their own bottlenecks. So the key thing is that they're all first class, all the different value streams, and we can't just treat the ones that are, where the customer's external uh, as the first class ones, because oftentimes the bottlenecks are lower down, right? If you've got some gaps in your, and this is, I think why the, the DevOps movement has been so transformational because so many, so many organizations over-focus on the customer-facing value streams and starve the internal ones. But what DevOps says is like, no, no, you need to actually invest in that delivery pipeline as a product. The pipeline's a product. And when you do that, all of a sudden you unlock all this value uh, of every single team that's building on that pipeline, that's delivering software through that pipeline. And, and that's you know, tremendously transformational. So yeah, so I think that the key thing is the internal product value streams and the developer facing ones uh, are, are just as first class. Thank you for clarifying that. So we have another uh, question over here in the chat. How would you deal with a central service silo that is causing delays in a value stream flow that you have to use instead of having a cross-functional team working on a value stream? Yeah, and that's actually, my answer to that is very closely related to that, to that other question or the other answer at least. Uh, so that, that central service, that needs to be treated. So what happens is these central services often will be silos 
Uh, and if they're treated as a first class product value stream that supports all these other product value streams, uh, and it has a roadmap and it has a stable team, and it's not this afterthought, uh, it's, and it actually is treated as first class, all of a sudden you'll notice that it becomes less and less of a bottleneck because that's exactly what happens. The, the central service, the silo, this database, whatever it is, those are, and we've all felt them in various ways, those are the common bottlenecks. And they're usually the common bottlenecks because they're architecturally mismatched with more modern parts of, of basically of the, of the software portfolio, or they're starved or they're legacy. And, and we all have them and we've all had them um, experience them in, in different ways, but they're just, they're, they're in almost every single organization. So basically the key thing is it needs to be treated as a first class product, which means it has its life cycle, it has its roadmaps, it has its flow metrics, the bottlenecks are understood. And then once you start treating it that way, you actually then have a sense of basically managing the life cycle of that product. In some cases, what can happen is the, um, it's, you've got so much legacy that you just should end of life it. You should strangle it out. You should move to more, let's say it's a storage service or something. You should move to more modern start cloud storage. And so the roadmap becomes, how do we migrate off this internal silo onto a new thing? And in other cases, you'll go, okay, well, this team understands this domain better than anyone else. Let's have, have them re-implement the new cloud-based storage service or the more modern, I don't know, event-based, event stream-based storage service or something. Uh, in other cases, you know, maybe you can actually get there through incremental improvements and through just investing a bit more and uh, and bringing more people to that team because it's bottlenecking so many other teams. Uh, so I think the key thing is to make it first class because it'll allow you to almost always, <clears throat> that thing requires more investment, just a question of how you invest and what its roadmap and strategy is. So that's how. So I think we have time for just one last question before we wrap up here. Um, so this seems like an appropriate last question to ask. What has happened with the Flow framework after the book was published in 2018? Yeah, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's been interesting and surprising to me. So as you can imagine this, and you know, I've spent a lot of time doing things like making APIs that get set in stone and regretting all these decisions <laughs> I've made <laughs> when you can't change anything in the next version of the API and so on. So. I was, uh, I had a high degree of paranoia. I messed something up. <laughs> and so I did, I just figured my best, and, and uh, I'd never written a book. So I realized it would be really hard to go and refactor a book as well, much harder than, than APIs. Um, so I talked, it was, it was two dozen people uh, who, you know, on, on the words. Yesterday I was speaking with Dean Leffingwell, who was, you know, looking at these, uh, we were talking, discussing the flow metrics. And, you know, he and I had the longest conversation should be flow velocity or flow throughput, right? So, you know, Talking to John Allspot with the risks that a lot of people in the enterprise DevOps uh, ecosystem and, and seniors. So um, I think it's been fortunate in the sense that uh, it's it's been stable. So I we f based on its the larger scale deployments of it, there have been some things that I think will there will be a version of 1.5 or 2.0. So um, at some point, like there just has to be, that's why I put 1.0 on it uh, to make that clear, <laughs> but there have not been any major changes to it um, right now that I think are required. So I just say, you know, run with it, just the amount of, because it's been working, it's effective, it's, it's been scaling in its current form. Uh, I'll give you one example though. Um, I, for the longest time, I wondered whether we should have a flow predictability metric or not where the flow predictability metric, again, going back to uh, Phoenix project, it's just the ratio of planned versus unplanned work. It's, it's, we know it's a really important thing to track. I just didn't want to overload things with, you know, with a, to keep it as simple as possible with the most meaningful metric. But the bottom line is, is a lot of organizations do, track, do, do have ways of tracking that, it's just less sophisticated yet. I just want to see more experimentation with it, more empirical data and how that's used, how it works, what it would look like in different visualizations of it. So. You know, flow predictability could be a, a very good addition to a, say a 1.5 version of the of the flow framework. But currently, if organizations are just tracking these, but I'm not sure, right? Maybe it's not as for, as first class. I'd like to see uh, you know more deployments, more data, more different visualizations of what it would look like before it's added. So right now, I think that the current 1.0 version is is sufficient for where we're seeing deployments of the flow framework right now. And then there are these interesting learnings. And thankfully, there's not been a fifth flow item. <laughs> 
that's what I was most worried about is that I'd somehow missed a, 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 one of the, a, there, there was another flow item, right? Um, but there are also interesting learnings on how, you know, let's say things like different types of incidents are actually map into sort of defects or debts and so on. So there's a lot of interesting learnings and, and data coming in from that. But yeah, right now it's stable. The thing that annoys me the most is I wish I'd made flow time on higher than flow velocity on the flow metrics because uh, that, that, that's the only thing that bugs me day to day because what I've realized is for most organizations, if you focus on flow time first, that's your answer. That's, that's, the, that's the number one flow metric. And so that's, that's been absolutely a, a key thing is uh, because flow times are so long and there's so much waste in so many organizations, uh, that's, that's just a great place to start rather than, you know, oftentimes there is a reaction of starting with flow velocity. Cloud transformations are in the end all about shortening flow time. Short, shortening flow time is how you end up, you know, actually reducing your costs. So, so yeah, I think uh, it'll take more data and analysis and we now have data scientists studying value streams and how these flow metrics work and so on. Um, so don't expect any, any major changes soon. Uh, but yeah, I kind of wish flow time were on top. <laughs> Maybe a small little caveat will, yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mick, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you taking the time. I want to let everyone know who's watching, of course, that you can learn more about Flow Framework from tasktop.com, uh, correct? You guys have tons of resources. You can also listen to Mick's wonderful Mick Plus One podcast uh, everywhere that podcast is stream, I believe. Um, for lots of great leadership uh, discussions. Um, and of course, you can see Mick at the upcoming DevOps Enterprise Summit next week. If you haven't registered, go register. You'll get to see Mick uh, talk even more about project to product. Uh, so once again, thank you so much, Mick, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye.